the people around us don't expect us to. And we built a system, a political system, a system of public policy based on old attitudes that actually allow us to have no expectations and believe that we will not work or participate in our in our communities. But in fact, we've discovered that the reality is just the opposite. Roberts and a group of fellow disabled students who called themselves the Rolling Flies set out to prove they could live outside institutions. They established the first CIL, the Center for Independent Living. Today there are hundreds of centers around the nation and the world. The centers preach an end to the segregation of the disabled from the rest of society, and the end to the separation of the kinds of disabled from each other, from the blind and deaf to the paralyzed and those impaired by disease and birth defects. In this class, a group of people with a variety of such handicaps learn how to live on their own, how to manage their own money, how to write a check. So that's um, just a taste of uh, what they were doing at Berkeley and the beginnings of the independent living movement, uh, which became, as Reitner says in the report, a um, national uh, movement. There are independent living centers here also in New York. Meanwhile, at the same time, over in London, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, a group of disabled people calling themselves the Union of Physically Impaired Against Segregation were beginning to formulate what's come to be called the social model of disability, though I would argue that we should actually think of it as social models of disability because there isn't just one, as we'll see in a um, But the social models of disability typically make a distinction between impairment and disability, where impairment is defined as the bodily or physical aspects of disability, or physical, as, bio, sorry, biological or physical impair, uh, aspects. Stop. Okay. And disability is the social consequences of impairment. So you see, now, this is very much like the sex-gender distinction, right? Where sex is supposed to be biological stuff, and gender is the social stuff that's imposed, well, as they put it, on top of our impairments, right? So, so this, many of the ver so versions of the social model rest on that distinction. Now, disability becomes a social category. And you can see that it's now being treated as equivalent to race, gender, ethnicity, right? It's a socially constructed category. Um, so disability, the disablement that disabled people face is now caused by society, not by impairments. So they break the connection between, the causal connection between impairments and disability. Impairment doesn't cause my, cause my disability. What society does to me causes my disability, they say. In fact, there are at least two main versions of the social model. One which became popular in Britain, and the one that has dominated here in the United States. The one that dominated here in the United States is a civil rights model, which tends to define disability in terms of discrimination and an unaccommodating environment, where that environment includes both the built environment, buildings, etc., and the social environment, negative attitudes, and so on. And if that's your view of where disability is, where it's located, then the solution is to fight for civil rights. In the UK, by contrast, the, uh, the social model has tended be inspired by Marxist theory. So for them, disability is created not by discrimination, but by a large, so, large social structures, particularly the economic system of capital. So they talk about how, for, in, for instance, the factory and the machines that people work created the need for a standardized body which then made it impossible for people with disabilities to get those kinds of jobs. Or how capitalism's demand for certain levels of productivity 
meant that certain people with disabilities were now excluded from the wage market. So they have focused on, uh, as I say, large social structures, particularly the economic system, as the cause of disability, as what disables people with impairments. For them, then, the solution is to well, abolish capitalism, but barring that, uh, uh, reform the capitalist system. So you can see that there are, there are more versions of the social model than this, but these have been the two um, dominant views. Now, why should we care about the social model? The social models of disability were really what got disability studies going. So since I'm a disability studies scholar, um, that this, is, this move, this intellectual move, right, from viewing disability as a medical condition to viewing disability as a socially constructed category is the heart of disability studies. Um, uh, also in the 1970s, we see the development of several, um, uh, several sort of disability, more, more impairment specific movements. Uh, one is the psychiatric system survivors movement. Has anybody heard of the psychiatric mm -hmm. system survivors movement? So this is uh, a movement by people who We have a moral imperative to fight for justice. Uh, a movement by people who reject psych well they don't necessarily reject psychiatric treatment. What they reject is when people are given psychiatric treatment against their wills. Mm -hmm. Right? And they're very critical of the psychiatric um, profession. I believe we really have no choice. Judy Chamberlain was one of the early Activists. In 1966, in severe emotional distress after a miscarriage, 21-year-old Judy Chamberlain was committed to a psychiatric hospital. Judy quickly discovered that once she became a patient, it was nearly impossible to regain her freedom. She was told that she would never be able to live outside an institution. The day that, that they took my own freedom away, was the day that I, I dedicated myself to this cause. I said, this is wrong. This is wrong. This should not happen to anyone. Judy defied her prognosis and went on to help found what is known as the psychiatric user, survivor, and ex-patient movement. It was the heady era of civil rights, consciousness raising, women's liberation, and gay liberation. Judy drew courage and inspiration from these popular movements. By 1971, she was working with the Mental Patients Liberation Project in New York, and the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, so that's a, just a, a flavor of the psychiatric system survivor movement. Um, another uh, activist in this movement is Dorothy Dundas, and um, in this, I don't know how we're doing for time, I won't play it. In this um, video, uh, she talks about her own experience undergoing insulin shock therapy. And one of the women she shared a room with actually died during the procedure. Um, she also notes that there is a gender bias in that she noted at the hospital where she was committed. And in some of her other videos on YouTube, she talks about her struggle to get her records back, right? Because one of the things that psychiatric system survivors have complained about is how psychiatric records, first off, they don't get access to them, and they're treated as the truth. And they follow people around for 30 years, right? Once you're diagnosed as something or other, then it's like you're always whatever that is. Right? And so many of them have struggled to get their records out of institutions. Um, yeah? What is insulin shock therapy? So that's when um, they give you a dose of insulin to induce a coma and then do the electroshock therapy. 
And if they, if the, they don't, they, well, they, they certainly don't do that anymore. They abandoned the insulin part uh, because it did lead to a number of deaths. Some people just didn't wake up after the struggle. Um, <clears throat> this is on a personal level here. When I got divorced and my children were really young, and my daughter in second grade, she got depressed. She was depressed. She saw mommy sad. Things have changed. She didn't understand. And the school called me up and they said, you know, your daughter's great. She used to be always raising her hand. She's not talking and everything. I think she needs some counseling. Is there something wrong at home? And I said, I'm going through a divorce. So she said, we have on hand these counselors and everything. And I chose not to do it because of the records. They have a record. And God forbid, it's just a, a, a you know, just a s certain time that she would get back to her norm, and that record would be left in, you know, you know, like for years. Oh, she had a problem. This is what happened. You know, that's terrible. Is yeah, and all, and then the records are are often used uh, to under underpin other kinds of discrimination, such as in hiring. Yeah, yeah. So. So yeah, it's it's um, it's. I think many of the criticisms of the psychiatric system survivor movement are are um, you know still good today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any laws protecting you from that kind of discrimination? Or no? uh, well, the ADA technically, if you can prove it, mm -hmm. right? But we're going to talk about this a little later. Um, the, you know, just how effective is the ADA is an open question. And Lorenzo's going to talk about the rights that you have and, and how to use them in, his, in, the, in their presentation. Um, just quickly, uh, the Psychiatric System Survivors Movement is still alive today. They had a rally as recently at the UN as, as 2012 here in New York. Uh, 